<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the fifth uh, annual uh, Patient-Driven Precision uh, Medicine uh, Conference. I'm uh, very pleased to see all of you and to uh, note that, uh, first of all, I would like to, because I always forget about these, so I'd like to get them out front. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank um, Samantha Lemos for having uh, really organized this conference. Thank you, Samantha. <laughs> and for the sponsorship of metadata and uh, Amazon Web Services, without which we would not be able to have this meeting and without which you would be very hungry uh, around noon. And so um, I want to thank them both for their leadership in sponsoring this and frankly, you should go and see what they're doing because they're engaged in very much the same kinds of things that we care about here and in fact, in some cases, directly collaborating with us. So um, before uh, I quickly uh, uh, introduce um, our next two speakers, I just want to note that I had the privilege of serving on the Precision Medicine uh, Committee of the National Academy of Sciences that wrote the original Precision Medicine Report, and I find myself increasingly have to make the following point, which is, although it is part of it, genomics is not the only part of precision medicine. Precision medicine really is about having a multidimensional perspective on our patients that is not just one data modality. It's not just about looking at uh, genomics, not just looking at the health record, not just looking at their Fitbit. It's looking at together so as if you were a very wise clinician, you'd have a well-rounded view uh, of that patient. And uh, that's one of the themes that we try to push. Second theme that we've been uh, emphasizing all along, because as I saw, a cropping of precision medicine conferences happen after uh, President Obama announced the Precision Medicine Initiative a couple years after our report, um, I thought it would be important to understand how patients cannot just be passive um, recipients of our, our, of our knowledge or passive supporters of this research, but actually active agents in um, delivering it. And that has been a theme uh, throughout our uh, now five years. And in doing so, we've been very clear that there's medicine, biomedical science, but very much center stage, the use of data science to drive that decision-making ma process. Because even though we all understand that medicine is a knowledge processing and information processing discipline, when you're looking at multiple dimensions, each with thousands, if not millions of variables, you have to start using computing seriously. And so I felt very fortunate as a department chair uh, at the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School to have a dean who without any uh, prompting, in fact, almost annoyingly, independently, uh, started uh, articulating uh, the following uh, themes, three themes, innovation and new therapeutics, directly from being pushed by, out by our academic institutions, and uh, data science. And so it's been a real uh, pleasure and uh, a unexpected uh, boost to have a dean who has such uh, well um, allied uh, expectations about how we're gonna move forward with data science in uh, precision medicine. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, our dean who also gets another theme of our conference, which is the importance of regulation and public buy-in. And he's done this not only uh, as a dean, but way before that, when uh, in his long career in uh, stem cell science, he had to uh, take on a very public role in making sure that we could do this safely and responsibly at scale. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dean George Daly. What a badge of honor to be called annoying by Zach Ahani. I love that. 
I aspire to become even more annoying, Zach, absolutely, if it means supporting initiatives like this. Good morning, welcome. Uh, this was one of my favorite meetings last year when I first attended. Uh, it's the fifth annual conference, and uh, every year it's been incredibly robust. For more than a century, uh, the concept of artificial intelligence has tantalized the imagination of scientists, uh, novelists, and philosophers. Uh, but it's no longer the stuff of science fiction. Uh, it's clearly and firmly entrenched in our lives. It's influencing everything we do, uh, from how we shop, to geopolitical conflicts, to healthcare. And without a doubt, AI will play a critical role, an increasing role, in biomedicine and, and healthcare. But uh, as with any new technology, as hinted at by Zach, there's promise and peril alike. So first, a little bit about the promise. 20 years ago, the National Academy of Medicine published a seminal report to air is human. And that acknowledged the imperfections of human clinical decision making and the limits of individual physician knowledge. Now both problems are becoming more acute. There are remarkable and ever-growing pressures on busy clinicians, the sheer volume of new biomedical knowledge they must absorb. It's becoming impossible for any individual to assimilate. But done right, AI can provide clinical decision support and reduce human error. So across nearly every discipline of medicine, from anesthesiology to urology, researchers are developing AI-driven tools that have the potential to reduce human error and increase the quality of clinical and diagnostic decision-making. AI will make us better doctors. Now, we've witnessed the advent of algorithms that are capable of detecting lung cancer in CT scans on a par, and soon much better, I would predict, than the most experienced radiologists. And others, other algorithms that can interpret the results of a fundoscopic exam of the retina with greater sensitivity than the average ophthalmologist. Now, predictive machine learning models may help us to make better decisions, such as one designed by a team led by one of our midday speakers, MIT professor Regina Barzilay which can gauge breast cancer risk up to five years in advance. And another, developed by a team led by Maha Farat in the Department of Biomedical Informatics here at the medical school, that can, in a fraction of a second, predict which frontline drugs a given strain of TB is resistant to. And then under the leadership of Zach Kahane, a cadre of clinicians, physician scientists, computational scientists, are harnessing the power of AI to shed light on how and why some people with cancer, so-called the enigmatic exceptional responders, defy extraordinarily bleak odds and respond to treatments that have otherwise failed in most patients. So AI also promises to transform drug discovery, therapeutic translation, for example, various deep learning algorithms such as one developed by Harvard Medical School systems biologists, are making key contributions to the broad effort of computationally predicting how proteins fold, which, if achieved, could really revolutionize our ability to rationally design drugs. We'll hear later today about efforts to use machine learning as a tool to reinvent the process of drug discovery from one of our own alums, Jim Tannenbaum. Jim is a a true renaissance man in the field of business and healthcare. And as many of you know, Jim was the catalyst behind the recently launched company in Citro, which aims to reinvent the process of drug discovery through machine learning. So AI has the potential to impact even the most rote aspects of our profession uh, by reducing administrative burdens, uh, streamlining clinical workflows, which I hope is going to free the physician up to spend more time with the patient. And of course, we will explore in depth today why AI holds particular promise in realizing the quest 
of achieving truly individualized health care, helping us to identify the optimal treatment for patients not merely based on their condition, but also on a constellation of individual genetic, epigenetic, and lifestyle variables, the concordance of which may not be recognized by physicians, but could be gleaned through unbiased machine-based learning. This goal appears well within our reach, highlighted by the genome editing revolution, which is profoundly altering the landscape of possibilities in terms of individualized, highly individualized diagnosis and treatment. And our final panel this afternoon will tackle precisely this topic. But what exactly does AI-powered precision medicine look like on the clinical front lines? So one example. So at Boston Children's Hospital, a team of geneticists used the power of whole genome sequencing and machine learning to identify the precise genetic aberration in a child with severe neurologic symptoms. They traced the malfunction to the non-coding part of a gene and identified the condition as a rare variant of the ultra-rare lysosomal storage known, uh, disorder known as Batten's disease. This is a it's really a devastating, rapidly progressive, ultimately fatal condition. And armed with this knowledge, our neurogeneticist, um, whom you'll hear from later, Tim Yu here, and colleagues, um, worked with the FDA to design a customized oligonucleotide therapy for this single patient. And that strategy could play out again and again. Another powerful example will be shared by our next speaker, Matt Might. Nearly a decade ago, Matt's son, Bertrand, became the first patient ever diagnosed with a disorder known as NGLY1 deficiency, and even more remarkably was treated for it. Matt's family's extraordinary story, as well as his personal odyssey as a parent and as a scientist, demonstrate the power of computationally enabled medicine. It's also a compelling example of how patient advocacy uh, and patient-driven scientific citizenship can inspire us all. So the promise of AI is clear, yet the road ahead will include some serious ethical, legal, socioeconomic, and technological bumps along the way. The growing use of AI in the clinic is bound to raise some difficult questions. Whose data are these? Who owns these data? How do we ensure their fair use, their application? How do we ensure equal access to AI-driven innovations? And how do we democratize access to these enabled treatments? This is, the, this is the, the looming question. And it's an acute challenge that we must face and we must solve together as a society. So there is a panel on policy and ownership of data later today, quite, quite apt. Another potential hazard stems from sheer technological vulnerabilities. A recently published commentary in Science, which was co-authored by Zach, demonstrates the technological weak spots of some of these new and promising technologies. For example, in the use of diagnostic imagery, such vulnerabilities might allow minuscule tweaks that are invisible to the human eye, maybe just a few pixels, that can completely alter a system's output, causing it to yield manifestly wrong conclusions. Such adversarial attacks, we've seen attacks on the IT infrastructure of our hospitals, they could subvert otherwise reliable machine learning systems. And until recently, these matters were the intellectual purview of informaticians. But today, with billions of dollars at stake in the output of these systems, they're drawing increased attention among various healthcare players. So we, we can't afford to be reactive when it comes to preventing such vulnerabilities, be they the result of malicious intent, as we've seen, or inadvertent glitches in the algorithmic behavior, the result of being as susceptible to biases as human behavior. So the old IT adage, garbage in, garbage out, comes to mind here. Uh, it underscores the importance of cautious design and the use of diverse data. 
Clearly, we have to ensure that the AI models in healthcare and research alike fully represent the biological, the genetic, and the ethnic diversity of the populations they are designed to serve, otherwise they won't function. The importance of training machines on diverse samples cannot be overstated. There are also inevitable and perhaps more transient risks inherent in the early iterations of emerging technologies. For example, how reliable are the EKG tracers in an Apple Watch? How about devices that measure a person's gait pattern as a proxy for therapeutic response to a Parkinson's drug? If we're to use these algorithms in patient care, disease progression, monitoring, clinical trials, we have to ensure that we work assiduously to minimize uh, the false positive and the false negative signals in these new applications. Think of the challenge and think of the disruption. We must address the myriad privacy and legal concerns of these emerging technologies. We've already seen the consequences of data acquisition overreach by Google and Facebook, both in social and in political life. Think about it in our medical lives. So coming from a, a, a long experience over the last two decades with the controversies, the ethical, legal, and social impact of new stem cell and embryo manipulation technologies, um, I am well aware of the challenges of these new emerging technologies, just as with AI, as we're facing those challenges today. So at once, they represent remarkable opportunities, but there's also a degree of uncertainty uh, that calls for significant prudence on our part. So how do we balance enthusiasm with caution, value with risk? They are just as relevant today as with any new emerging technology. So I think the question that this symposium poses, can AI accelerate precision medicine? It's a rhetorical one. Our answer is obviously yes. We're truly in the midst of a revolution. Many of you in this room are charting its course and shaping its outcome. I think we all are here and enthusiastic because we're collectively excited by what this field offers for the future. Because I think we collectively believe that it's going to transform the future of human health and the future of well-being. Thank you very much and enjoy this outstanding conference. Thank you, Dean Daly. You uh, spared me uh, having to do with your magisterial introduction to AI and its implications. I now no longer have to do that, so I and the audience thanks you.